has this really interesting, uh, really interesting alchemy going on of, of both a strong uh, emphasis on justice, a strong emphasis on God's fairness for all, but also one that is done with joy and gratitude. In many ways, it's about what I call building beloved community. And it has always seemed to me that Union Church is a place that is about building beloved community. Boundless love, hospitality, kindness, peace, justice, all of the things that we want for our world, this church stands for. Paul says instead, do what you do. Do what you do for you. Since coming here, I realize that there is a community that will love you, whether you believe one thing or another, it's that we're worshiping together as a community, that we're giving of ourselves, whether it be as Sunday school teachers, or as musicians, sharing our talents, or tithing what you can, or tithing in other ways, you know, in non-monetary ways. I give of my time, money, and uh, my spirit, part of the community. I enjoy being part of a faith community. I give in ways that I can as a student, which is through my creativity. I sing in the choir. Tom helps with the Sunday school class. We kind of look at it as a give back, because we have received so much. Union Church uh, works in many areas. We work locally, we work state and nationally, and we work internationally. So some of the folks that we give to are developing communities in El Salvador. We give to Bread for the World. We also give locally. We work with things like our Women's Creative Sewing and Crafts program. Union Church folks and probably people in general are very, very concerned about what goes on in the world and have many things that they could give their money to. You shouldn't give money to anything that doesn't really matter to you. I think you should support Union Church if you care about a, a future where there might be more peace and more justice. If you want to see that world built, uh, supporting Union Church is a great way to start. And Union Church then can support the next generation and the next generation and the next generation of leaders who will, I hope, bring us closer to that goal. We want to make sure that the doors are open uh, and all people feel welcome and anybody is welcome here and a member is someone who decides I'm going to be the one to help make sure those doors are open. It's easy to stay within budget. All we have to do is not do the things that make us a great church. We could cut children's programming and we could cut music out. We could stop all of that. We spend a lot of money on those things but we do that because they matter. They really matter. If we stop that just to balance a budget, we're not being the church God calls us to be. Membership means commitment. Everyone has a part to play. Planning means thinking ahead. Make a pledge, be our future. 
Support the church. And the social justice issues that matter to all of us. We're serving and loving together. We're serving and loving together. We are serving and loving together. We're serving and loving together. Union Church is serving and loving together. Will you join us?
Good morning, all. Good morning. Good morning. We invite you to find a good spot to sit. You are find warming up the space. It's um, wonderful. Yes. Thank you for coming out on a cold, cold morning, and a special welcome to all of you. Uh, we're very glad you're here. As you can tell, I have picked up my uh, my semi-annual cold, so uh, congratulations to me. But I uh, I'm feeling I'm feeling well. But if I am not hugging you quite as closely as I might want to, you will know that it is my gift to you this season to stay away. I want to also welcome while we're gathering. I want to welcome all of our web viewers. Thank you so much for being a part of our service, even at a distance. Uh, Union Church, webcasts, all of the services. So if you are here and uh, like something that you see but can't make it to church, you are always welcome to join us live at 1030 by watching as these people are doing at home. Or you can they're recorded, so you can also watch them at a time that is more convenient for you all whenever you can be there. So we're very grateful that you're here, and we're very grateful for all the spirit that you bring to us from, uh, from afar. Indeed, we want to make sure that you have everything that you need. Um, and uh, you'll notice that there are a lot of special visitors today, many of them wearing these little orange badges. Um, these are folks from Christmas Country Dance School. Uh, we are so glad that you are here. Some of you come every year. Some of you, this might be your first time. Um, so we want to say a special welcome. And we have special musicians um, that will be playing Indeed. with us today as well. We're really grateful. Uh, we have special musicians all over the place. Uh, from the church itself, we want to welcome Rob Hayden, who is at the mighty Wurlitzer up there and we'll be leading our preludes and music and then from Christmas Country Dance School we have Nathan Wilson and his daughters Adela and Anna who are going to play for us uh, they are wonderful wonderful musicians and I uh, and dear friends and we're very glad for that uh, for those of you who don't know uh, I actually only knew about Berea because of Christmas Country Dance School and this will be my 34th Christmas uh, crossing over New Year's uh, in Berea with all of you so uh, thanks to that <laughs> uh, as, we're, uh, as we're having some announcements, you'll find somewhere on the edge of your uh, pew a red pew folder. And if you wouldn't mind to sign in and pass that down, it's also wonderful if you wanted to check in on Facebook or, or uh, any of your other social media, that's a good time. But also if you wouldn't mind just to check and make sure that your device is on uh, stun. If it'll uh, turn it to stun mode, silence, that will be helpful for the Except rest for the of the sermons. For, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is nice. <laughs> We have uh, some large print bulletins, as I think uh, Rachel mentioned, and we also have uh, back there a little center uh, where if you are, need extra wiggle room, you can uh, have as much uh, crayon interaction as you might need, whether you are young or old. We're very, very uh, glad to provide that, and I see we already have some takers. Yes, and the, the um, Children's Worship Center is open. The nursery is also open. Um, we welcome children throughout the entire service, but whatever makes it the best worship experience for your family, that's what we want. So. Uh, if you need help finding something like the nursery or anything else, please just ask somebody near the back and they will help you. Several of us, are, or several of you, I know, are going to try and uh, duck out to get to the next event over at Christmas School, so we'll try to keep things moving along. But if you do need to duck out, please feel free to do so. You are very welcome to make whatever moves you need to when you, oh, when you need to be at your next class. Uh, we'd like to, for those of you who can linger, we hope that you'll join us for some refreshments in the parlor, which is just directly through either door to our right or left, and uh, you'll find that you'll uh, have some homemade goodies in there to share as we cross over into the new year. You have made some special people, uh, you have made some special goodies possible this year. I, those of you who participated with us in the Christmas basket program, we were able to provide shopping and food for more than 145 families in partnership with St. Clair Catholic Church. So thanks to all of you big who did that deal. shopping. Big deal. It's a big deal. Well done. That is a lot of work and we owe a lot to St. Clair and all their, their organization over there and we owe a lot to you all who provide funds and shopping and, and opportunities for families to have a much safer, healthier Christmas. If you are local, we want to invite you to Wednesday Night Live this Wednesday. Uh, we will be kicking off our new year with a potluck. Um, so feel free to bring all of your, you know, black IP leftovers and things like that. But uh, come on Wednesday night, 545. We'll join in dinner and fellowship uh, and a, a good time to bring warm bodies together and uh, nurture each other on these cold nights. 
We like to keep a lot of folks in our prayers, and you may have some too, but we have several that we'd like to, to share with you. Uh, first and foremost, uh, today is Sarah Rohr's birthday. I don't know if Sarah, if you're watching at home, we hope that you're having a good one, and we're thinking about you. Uh, we also have listed some people in the bulletin and hope that during the prayer time later on in the service, you'll find some silent prayers and that you might uh, hold those folks in your thoughts as we, as we go through that silent time. We have good news on Loyal Jones, uh, that he has been moved to Cardinal Hill for rehab. So many of us have been following his progress, and this is very good. We're also glad that Jackie Perman is in rehab, continues to be recuperating there. So we're thinking about, uh, thinking about you guys if you're able to see us. And Judy Singleton has had some continuing ups and downs with her blood pressure and would really love your prayers. Uh, and she, she is at home, um, but is looking for the right medical treatment. So. Right before Christmas last week, we, we announced that uh, BJ Godby had had to have surgery. And so we're hoping that, uh, that she's recuperating at home. Uh, we saw Rick this morning and he said things are moving ahead, but I know that's a long haul. She had surgery on her ankle. So uh, we hope that, uh, hope that you're watching and hope that you're feeling better too. Indeed. Each week, as you know, we light a justice candle, and this is a way of reminding ourselves of the ways that the light of Christ is born forth in the world. Today, we want to remember that tonight is in addition to a big party night. It was a very big deal for African Americans and white abolitionists, uh, especially, and freed blacks in the North. They began in 1862-3, over the night, um, the Watch Night service. And this was because on January 1st, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation took effect. And so these two groups got together and began a service of celebration and freedom of newness and a new year. As you know, the Emancipation Proclamation itself did not free anyone until the end of the Civil War and the 13th Amendment came into place. But it was an important step in, um, in bringing forth the hope of the new year. And so as we watch this 2017 turn over into 2018, may our prayers be for greater freedom and for release of oppression and for renewal of hope. Amen. Union Church played a role in that for those visitors and friends who are here. Uh, Union Church was in exile at that time, having had, uh, we were run out of town because we were an abolitionist biracial church at the time. In 1859, just before the Civil War, a lynch mob rode down from the city of Richmond, 12 miles north, and made death threats against both pastor and all of the members of the church, many of whom fled. They fled west, out towards Lancaster Road. They burnt all the church records so no one could go to the neighboring farms and say, aha, you're a member of that church. And they lived, most of them, across the river in the Cincinnati or in the environments during the Civil War, during this time. So in 1862, 1863, the watch night services for this church were held across the river north of the Ohio so that we could eventually return back here, which they did at the conclusion of the war, and restart the, the church again as we worshipped afar. We came back together. And when we came back, many, many of those who had been emancipated, who joined the Union Army, were discharged at a camp about 30 miles west of here, and this church invited and provided food and supplies to the families who followed the soldiers, and then uh, we tried to make a, a utopian community of black and white living together in Berea. That's how Berea got founded. For that time period, from 1865 up through about the 1870s, Berea was about 51% African American and 49% Euro American. The businesses were interleaved right and left next to each other, and uh, but it was economic pressures that began to drive things north. The South was, uh, was oppressed a little bit, and as economic opportunity for both poor whites and poor blacks made folks uh, much more likely to move to the northern uh, mills. Berea now, however, is about 97% Euro-American, and we, we grieve that lack of diversity, but we seek for the world that includes and invites all. So we hope that wherever you are in your place, that you too will seek that light and that love, and that whatever way may seem right in your place. 
For now, however, we will fall together in peace in this place, for we have come this day not as by accident, but by choice. God's choice and yours. So may we be at peace together here. May we find together the light, that same light of justice and joy as we worship. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the very last day of 2017. Please stand in body and or spirit as you are able and wish to. When Jesus is born to Mary and Joseph, God's there. when the shepherds leave their fields to find newborn joy, God sends them. When Mary and Joseph make the long trip to Jerusalem, God goes before them. When Jesus is presented at the temple, God awaits. When Simeon holds Jesus in his arms, God smiles. When Anna recognizes Jesus in the temple, God rejoices. This very morning, God is here. From all the places we have known, God calls us. In remembering the year past, God is present. In the future we cannot see, God goes before us. In the traveling we do together, God delights. Let us worship God. We will join in singing opening hymn number 153.
us now turn toward that surprising God with our prayer of approach and confession. On this sixth day of Christmas, as another year draws to a close, we come together before God and with one another, confessing the ways in which we have been caught up in the frenzied spirit of the holidays and turned away from your spirit of peace. The times we have focused so much on our own lives and desires that we have neglected the voices of your children who cry out for justice or help. In the times that we have dismissed Christmas as a time only for children, and we have stubbornly closed our hearts to your amazing gift of love. O holy child of Bethlehem, word become flesh, our savior and king. Hear us as we humbly pray, cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. Friends, um, amen. <laughs> Important part. Friends, hear the good news of Christmas. That's what I was so excited to get to. Today reveals, God reveals to us the wonders of divine love. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven and able to start anew. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven and able to start anew. Hallelujah and amen. Friends, as renewed and peace-filled people, let us pass the peace of Christ with one another. The bulletin sadly omitted the special music that we have, but uh, uh, this is the place for it, and here are the people to do it.
Amen. Wow, as usual. <laughs> you guys are awesome. So today's Hebrew scripture lesson is actually one of my favorites. It's from Isaiah 61, verse 10, through Isaiah 62, verse 3. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. God has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, for as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until her vindication shines out like the dawn, and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication, and all the kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right, well, we would like to invite our young and young at heart uh, to come up over here, and we will talk a little bit more about how Christmas has been. everybody. How are you? Good. Good. All right. Very good. Yeah, it was good at my place, too. It was wonderful. How was your Christmas, Reverend Rachel? It was very exciting. Was it? Yes. We, we got to see uh, Jack open presents from Santa for the first time that he was able to do that. <laughs> it's very exciting. <laughs> Did you know that it's still Christmas? Need to know that, right? Well, you know how would you right. The, sometimes the it's hard to know, but it, the, in the church here, it's still Christmas. Christmas is a whole twelve days long, just like the song says, right? It's uh, it's pretty decent. <laughs> there is uh, there's the beginning of it, which is Christmas Eve and the presents and the stars and the shepherds and all that stuff. But it lasts all the way around through the story, two whole weeks until we get to the place where does anybody know what next week will be? Who comes to visit Jesus later on? They got crowns Three king, on. We got, we got right. the answer. They ding, got ding, kings. Ding. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. They come with them. So we, we call that, that's the end of Christmas. That's, and sometimes it's called old Christmas. So we're right smack in the middle of Christmas. It's this whole long celebration. It's fantastic. <laughs> and you may have noticed, uh, if you were at a Christmas Eve service, um, you may have noticed that there were, we have five candles now lit, and here's our little uh, paper uh, candles, and we have one in the middle. What's the one in the middle represent? Here's a hint. It was somebody who was born on Christmas. <laughs> Anybody at all? <laughs> Well, I'm so glad you came. <laughs> no, one, no one is brave. They so all are know, very smart, yeah. but they're not okay. brave. Okay. Yes, so the person who was born on Christmas was Jesus. And we celebrate Jesus' birth, Jesus' coming into the world, and bringing God's good news of love and joy for all people. And one of the ways that we do that was we light these candles, and then on Christmas Eve, and a lot of you weren't here at our church, so I don't know how you celebrated Christmas Eve, but we take this candle, something about fire, right? I mean, fire, especially in the dark of night, having a candle light up is very special. And when we're sitting here in the dark of Christmas Eve, and all these people take their candles and they light them, 
and they pass that light to somebody else and that light glows all around and everybody looks beautiful and you remember the best part of every person when we do that. And so what we wanted to do today was give you all, if you weren't here on Christmas Eve, or even if you were and you want another one, um, give you a candle to help remind you that Jesus light has spread to you and that you get to spread that light to everyone you meet. Now, we're not going to actually light them right now. When you go home, your parents can decide how you, they want to help you light these. Um, what's that? Appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm much better about this now that I have one of my own. Um, <laughs> um, but the symbol, even if it's in a drawer or something, when you open that drawer and you see it, remember that you have a little bit of Christ in you. And you get to spread that light, that love, that joy, that beauty, however you do it best to everyone else. And that is why Christmas is not just one day or even 12 days, but whenever that happens, whenever you can pass light like that, whenever you can receive it from somebody else or give it to another, I would say that that is what Christmas, that Christmas could happen every day of the year. So uh, that's our goal. We're ending one year, and tomorrow it'll be a new 2018, but every day in it could be a day to pass some light to somebody else. Here's for you. Here's yeah. a little light. All right. Well, uh, let's Rachel, do that after we pray. Yeah, let's, okay. let's, let's see if we've got some prayers. Anybody got special prayers you need? What are you thinking about as you're crossing over into 2018? You praying for anything special? New Star Wars movie. New Star Wars uh, movie, yeah. Yes, that's that's right. Give praise for that. Amen. You got anything you're thinking about? Children. Yeah. Children, yes. Absolutely. Right, the great gratitude for all for the people that. who love us and are around us. Absolutely. Anything else? We're grateful for, for uh, your grandma getting feeling better. Anybody? Okay. Well, I think right. we should pray. Let's pray. All right, would you join us? God, thank you for the light of Christmas. Thank you for the ways that Jesus' love shines in our hearts and we can take it forward out into the world. We ask especially that you be with us in our moments of joy, whether they are new movies or new toys or all of these things, that we know they are blessings from you. And also we give you thanks for the blessings of children, each one here and each one that we know and love in our hearts. May you continue to show your joy through them. Be with all the people who need healing and continued well-being, that they may know your comfort and your presence. And together we say, Amen. Amen. Thanks, you guys. Right. Thanks for coming. So up. if you want a candle, you can take yeah. a candle. Yeah, come get your candle if you want. my slightly sore throat. Our gospel reading this morning is from the Gospel of Luke and continues the story that Luke tells about the early days of Jesus. I'd like to take a liberty and read a little bit longer than the passage that you see listed in the bulletin. I'll be reading to verses 55 rather than stopping at 40. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, Jesus' parents brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord as is written in the house of the Lord, in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms, praised God, saying, 
Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you've prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, she was of great age, having lived with her husband for seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but she worshipped there with fasting and prayer day and night. At the moment she came and began to praise God and speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Israel. And when they had finished everything required by the law, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. Now the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. But every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover after that. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. Then the festival was ended and they started to return, but the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't know it. Assuming that he was with a group of travelers, they went a day's journey, and they looked for him among their relatives and friends, and when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions, and all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. That is not what she said. <laughs> but it was probably like that. And he said to them, Why are you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. And then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. Here ends the reading of the word. Let us pray. Holy One, may we too increase in wisdom and in favor with you, both by what we think and what we say, but mostly by what we do, Lord. May we always reflect the light that you have placed in our hands. Holy One, grant your people wisdom in this moment that we may discern together your will and your way. Amen. Well, here we are, about to cross the line into 2018. We're about to cross a lot of lines, actually. I've been thinking about that this whole year. This has been, 2017 has been a year of crossing lines I never thought I would. Some of them were picket lines. Some of them were making lines in the sand. Some of them I saw politicians crossing lines I never thought they would cross. We have seen an astonishing variety of things maybe we wished we hadn't. In this scripture passage, all of Luke's telling is about God crossing the line into human experience. And in this particular one, you have those who kind of butt in to the life of this young family to cross the line and speak their prophecy. Simeon, who shows up and says, I've seen it. I've seen the salvation, and it's this small, snot-nosed kid who needs a diaper change. And Anna shows up, and Anna, who has lived to great age, praying, dedicating, doing all the things that you and I know we're supposed to but never have the time to, there she is doing it all, and she steps up and she says, Hey, have you seen this kid? Have you seen that kid? Have you seen the kid? You should go see the kid. That's the kid. That's the one. She crosses a line. Propriety would have been, hey, hands off. Leave it alone. That's not your business. Keep it to yourself. If you've got a weird thought from God, let's just, you know, go pray silently in your closet. 
But prophets are rarely able to do that. It's what makes them a prophet. They refuse to stay quiet, and they're unable to stay on their side of the line. They step across it in terms of social propriety. They step across it in terms of their own, <laughs> their own best interest in terms of speaking truth to power. Rarely a safe enterprise. Rarely, rarely something that gets you noticed by the right people except for the wrong reasons. And is that really any different now? Prophets... Young and old have said what our world is coming to, and in some cases, they have crossed the line. When is it that we should step over the lines of those proprieties? This is what I've been meditating on. It is not true that you should always color within the lines. This was a lie they told you early and young. It is not true that you should never cross lines. In fact, if you are looking at this from a Hebrew or a Christian context, it is required that you cross the lines at certain points. Think about it. Think about it with me. Should Moses have simply been the dutiful son-in-law and never crossed the line back into Egypt? Should Miriam have kept silent when all of the people were saved, having crossed over the Red Sea. All of those people who stepped up and stood out didn't do that because they followed the rules. They found reasons to do what was right, even when the rules said, ah, 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 no, 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 stay on your side of the line. My, uh, my kitchen at home is sort of in a triangle, and there's these two little outlets, and I have, a, have a, an island that faces out. And when cooking for a lot of people, I know right where things are behind me, right? And I am often yelling at visitors and guests, and even my own mother, stay behind the yellow line. I'm in my space. You're in my space. But the story of Christmas is really of God stepping into our space. And every once in a while, God willing, God willing, you too will step rightly into somebody else's space. That latter half, that latter half of Luke's telling of, of, of Jesus' childhood, which we have no corroboration for. We have no idea if Luke was the only person who knew this or if he just thought this would be an excellent addition to an otherwise fantastic story. But the meditation it causes in us is as holy as if it were truth. Jesus goes back to the temple and finds his, himself. He finds something of himself there, drawn to it, Enough to do the most horrible thing you could do to first century Palestinian parents. Get lost. That's the worst possible thing. Family was everything. You stuck together. You traveled as a group. You lived together. You did things together. You looked after each other. You did not stay in the temple for three days and not tell anybody. You did not not send word. You did that. But here's the thing. Jesus steps across that line because of something greater, deeper, more important. It's the same reason, uh, if I may be permitted, a dance metaphor. It's the same reason that dancing at its best doesn't keep us all in the same place. If you never step out in a dance, if you never cross over, there are no interesting figures. There is no possibility of a circle. There is no way that you can, in fact, interact in the deep joy that is the communion of saints. You have to cross that line to, to some newer configuration. Jesus does this in this way for himself. He sticks behind and he's listening and he's finding his own self. My friend, Bell Hooks, says that education is the truest form to freedom. In that wonderful book, Teaching to Transgress, if you have not read it, go, go now, get it, buy it, read it. But she says this, 
Home was the place where I was forced to conform to someone else's image of who and what I should be. School was the place where I for could forget that self and through ideas reinvent myself. Luke gives us a picture of the reinvention of self, the reinvention of Jesus. From being just the kid on the block to becoming the savior of all. Now, it's not all there yet. It's just a seed. It's just a planting. Who knows what the rabbis were telling him? Who knows what he found interest in? But certainly, later on, he steps into a pulpit. He picks up a scripture. He opens it up, and he reads from Isaiah, I have come this day to let the lame walk and the blind see, to proclaim the year of God's favor. So something snuck in. Something got there. We too have to reinvent ourselves. Lord knows this world needs a little reinvention from the way it is currently configured. It is set up with people set into lines that are not made on the floor and made of charitable dancers holding hands. It is made with lines bound in chains and strapped with iron. People are set by themselves. They are isolated and in iron cages. Some literal, some of the mind and heart. And we, if we stay only on our own side of the line and don't get into that space, we'll leave them there to rot. Even as we ourselves suffer, diminish, and ultimately perish as isolated fools. We, too, must transgress against the idea that we are not our brother and sister's keeper. We are, and they are ours. We are, indeed, caretakers, caregivers for one another. But if you were going to stay in the lines of propriety, you would mind your own business. You would not make the phone call. You would not donate the money. You would not ask someone to please stop that. You would not hold others to account. You would simply head down, walk away. But I would rather that you learn to transgress in 2018. For the right things. It's, it's not like politicians tell you. This is not a team sport, right? Just getting a bill passed does not make you a good legislator. Passing a good bill makes you a good legislator. It is not just being, you know, that you are radical, being out and doing something that makes people irritated. That does not make you radical. That makes you irritating. <laughs> But if you are out there irritating people, being the burr under the saddle of injustice, thanks be to God, you should be a little pointy. You should not be tolerating injustice or inconsideration, unkindness, lack of charity. You should not be happy with that. Step out. Cross that line a little bit. Stop somebody when you see them doing something poorly to another's heart, head, or hand. Jesus crosses this line of social propriety, not so that you could have a fun story, but so that we might have a model of when and how to transgress the strictures of our own lives, the, the constricted ideas of our own selves. Stepping up, stepping out, that's how you dance. Stepping over, Stepping out is how you change the world. This week, this year, this, this decade, there have been so many changes that if we were to name them all, we would be here all day, all night, and through next week. But change for its change self is not good. Change for good is good. In my mind, Luke, through this experience of Jesus, points us right back to Isaiah. Clothing us with garments of salvation is not a personal activity. It's not something for you to feel saved. But the garments of salvation are wide and broad. 
We are indeed making a tent of salvation. We are meant to be building a, a glorious kingdom, not a kingdom. And to do that, we're going to have to cross some lines. It cannot be okay for white men to own everything and dictate to all how wealth should be spent or power distributed. We're going to have to cross some lines of history. It is not okay to think that because brown people die and white people don't, that white people are not involved or shouldn't care or don't have to be in part of the solution. It, it cannot be that we'll just say, oh, well, gosh, I'm so glad some people made it and are rich and rich beyond wealth, beyond counting. It, it, it cannot be that we can just sit around and say, well, yeah, that's good. Let's just give them some more money. And you know what? I know. Let's take it from the poorest people. That'd be good. Yeah, let's do that. No. No. Not if you serve this God. Not if you follow this Christ. This one will tell you, you got to get up into the space of people and speak truth, loving truth, to power. You must be able to. You must. You must, like Anna, start telling everybody, hey, there's a different way. You've got to, like Simeon, say, all right, I can see it, but I'm not going to get there unless you help me. You've got to, like Jesus, sit down and take the three days to learn what you need to know in order to get up to teach and transgress. 2018 is coming. You've got hours, hours to reinvent yourself for this new reality. You do not have to drag everything from 2017 into 2018. Hear me, Mitch McConnell. <laughs> Hear me, O oh church. Hear me. Hold fast to what is good and strong and best. Carry that with you like a treasure. But step boldly into 2018, looking for the new, finding the best, seeking the lost, and offering yourself to this light we so dearly deeply need. It's time to cross the line. Amen. Amen. Let us stand forth and sing as we get, gather our energy to cross the line.
So in our opening hymn, we were reminded of the surprising ways that God works, including surprise offering. So uh, we, we uh, have had our call to offering after the offering has been taken. Um, but if you should be inspired to give again <laughs> as they come forward, we, we will not stop you, just so you know. Uh, but we do give of ourselves in every way, not just financially, but we give of ourselves by sharing that light of Christ forward. And so as we listen to our beautiful special offering music, we can meditate on that and on the, the light that we get to carry forward.
Please be seated. Before we leave this place, we'll take just a few minutes and we'll pray together to find in that silence of falling together in silence a, a communal grace, a hopeful strength. So knowing that we're always in God's presence and wherever you go and wherever you came from and wherever you're headed to after this, feeling that power and that presence, let us fall silent now so that we may gather in all that we need to take with us into the new year and leave behind all that we need no longer carry. Let us pray. As we pray, we lift our prayers for those who have come today as strangers and guests to this congregation. We pray that God's people may sustain them, that God's words may inspire us together, and that the love of Jesus be shown to all. Remembering our world in all local churches is part of our ecumenical prayer cycle. We lift in our prayers the peoples of Egypt, Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, and occupied Palestine, and the friends and members of Calvary Apostolic Church who are our sisters and brothers, that the hand of God will always cradle and guide us all, and that the works of God will be our yeast and our pearl. Lord, we carry in our hearts the joy and concern of so many in our midst, some we have named, others whom only you know. Hold and heal us all, named and known to you, in body, mind, and spirit, that we may be made one in communion with you. Lord, we are about to cross over. Every moment we are poised on the brink of the next second, the next week, the next decade, our next era. Flowing through time, may we hold fast to all that is wise and good. Reinventing ourselves, may we choose well the lines to cross. Stepping into each new moment, grant us integrity that we may bind together all parts of our hope. Help us cross timelines and lines in the sand with hearts of fierce compassion and resolute joy in the care of all. Stepping out from the hurts of the past weeks and months and years and decades, May we cross today and every day into new life bearing the seeds of your kingdom in our hands. God in community, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, we reach to you as our maker, our mother, and our father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 433, and I invite you to rest on your feet if you're willing and able to join us in that as we think about the seeds of promise.
May the seeds of hope and grace planted in you well before you were ever known by your true name now. May those seeds prosper and flower in this coming moment, in this coming week, in this coming year. May God give you strength to cross the line from underground to great glorious above sky. And may you and all yours be embraced with holy love in Christ's name, now and always. Amen.